Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your glory. Thank you, Lord God, that you just stand ready to meet us. You're amazing, Lord. You don't hide behind bushes. You don't make us to jump through hoops to get to you. Uh, you're, you're here. If we could see in the spirit, you would be a half an inch in front of our faces. We're so busy looking and doing other things, Lord God. Forgive us for that. And thank you, Lord God. Thank you that you do forgive us and excuse that completely. Thank you, Lord God, that you just stand ready to meet us. We worship you, Lord. We glorify you. I just pray over every heart in this room. Just a real preparation, Lord God. Just a preparation to meet you. A preparation to uh, grow in you. A preparation to have a meaningful experience in you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. We glorify you. We commit Angel to your care. He's worked hard. He's prepared. He's got an outline here. And... Uh, and I just thank you for Angel, and I just pray you bless him as he teaches, Lord God. I pray that you open the ears of our understanding, Lord God, to revelation to things you want to show us, Lord Jesus. I pray you bless Jonathan and Kristen as they worship later in all their hard work. We give you our lives. We give you the evening, Lord. We commit ourselves to your care. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Bruce. All right, you guys. Well, welcome to Oikos. As we say every week, Oikos is our humble attempt to allow Jesus to carry us home where we find rest and we're refreshed for the work ahead. So last week, we began our new series on I Am the Good Shepherd. And we've been talking about this discourse that Jesus began that started with the blind beggar and how he began talking to these Pharisees. And last week, he really, really honed in on this whole idea of how he is the true shepherd. And the true shepherd will come in the proper way. The true shepherd will come in through the door. The false shepherd or the thieves, they're going to go around and they're going to try to sneak in. But the true shepherd comes in through the door. And we explained this whole idea of what it meant for Jesus coming in through the door. You know, we saw how Jesus came in through that door of prophecy. He came in at the perfect time. He didn't sneak around. You know, he tells the Pharisees in one of his discussions with them in John chapter 5. He tells them in John 5, 39, you search the scriptures for, um, you search the scriptures for in them you think that you have eternal life and these they testify of me. And so we see this reality of what Jesus is saying, how this whole idea of the scriptures, they all speak of him and he came in fulfilling this. He came in through that door. So we see he went on and he talked a little bit about the sheep. And he talked about how the sheep hear his voice. The sheep know him, they recognize his voice, and they go after him. And if we look so far where we're at in the Gospel of John, we've already seen this happen. We've seen his sheep recognize his voice. We saw it with Peter. We saw it with Philip, with Nathaniel, with Nicodemus, with the woman at the well, with this blind beggar. We see that they hear the voice of the shepherd, they recognize, and they follow Today, he's going to go ahead and he's going to continue this discussion. And remember last week how we talked about there's two sheep folds, right? There's the one you have in the village with the wall. And then there's the one that's in the country that is basically a pile of rocks with thorns. So essentially today, that's what we're going to focus on. He's going to move on. Last week, he was in the village and he was calling the sheep out. Now he's out in the country and he's out in the country with the sheep. And he's talking about this fold that is out in the country so why don't we go ahead and open our Bibles to John chapter 10. And tonight we're going to be in John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. So while you guys um, go ahead and open your Bibles, I'm just going to pray for the word. Lord God, I just come before you right now, Lord. And as always, I just ask that your Holy Spirit just come upon this place, Lord. Come upon this room, Lord God. I just pray that you're able to use me, Lord, as your vessel. That you're able to use me to speak to your bride, what it is that you want to share with your bride tonight, Father in heaven. And I just pray that your holy truths are revealed, Lord God, that it's not the word of man, but that, that it's the word of God. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see beginning in verse 7, it says, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. 
And not whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So we see this is the text for tonight, you guys. And to sum it all up, we could sum it all up in two words, right? Door and thief. And that's essentially what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about what the thief does. And we're going to be talking about this whole idea that now Jesus presents of him being the door. And, you know, and off that bat, what does that even mean? You know, what is he talking about? He just said last week that he was the shepherd. But now he's like, now I'm the door. So what is it, Jesus? You know, are you the shepherd? Are you the door? Like, what's going on? What exactly are you speaking? And we're going to see that they go hand in hand. Being the shepherd and being the door go hand in hand. And we see one of the many I am statements of the Gospel of John. And notice how he says, I am the door. He doesn't say, I'm, I am a door. But he says, I am the door. In another verse, he will say, I am the way. He is the only means. He is the only path for us to approach the Father. For us to approach God. We see if we look at the other places in Scripture, there's only one gate to the tabernacle. There's only one bell before the Holy of Holies. There's only one high priest between the, um, the people and God. And we see now here tonight, he's telling us that there is only one door. We see in John where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Once again, we see in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he sa- um, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So we see then this reality of Jesus Christ, then the door. He is the means in which we approach the Father. And so he tells us this night, he tells us, this this is what it means then for him to be the door. So remember we talked about the shepherd's fold, right? And we said, you're in the country now, you have a whole bunch of piles of just rocks with thorns all around, but there's no door. And there would never be a door because the shepherd would be the door. They would bring in all the sheep and the shepherd himself would be the one that would stand in the gap. He would be the one that would defend and protect the sheep. No sheep could leave the fold unless they went through the shepherd and no thieves, no wolves could get into the fold unless they snuck around like he said, but they could not get through the door unless they went through the shepherd. And so we see that expression in a sense of over my dead body is essentially what the shepherd is saying. And by Jesus telling us that he is the door He is telling us tonight then that he is the shepherd on duty. He is the shepherd that is watching over us. He is the shepherd that is protecting us. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to really look into this idea of a door then. Because what exactly does a door do and what does it then mean for us in this context of what Jesus is saying? The first thing we see that a door does is it means separation. There's an in and there's an out when there is a door. You're either inside, behind, closed doors, in safety, or you're outside with all the crazies. And we see that this is the separation that he's doing here for the sheep. They're inside, protected from all the wolves and from all the thieves. The second thing we see that a door provides is it creates division. And like I just said, you're either in or you're either out. There's no in between. There's no one foot in, one foot out. It's either in or out. And we see in Luke, Jesus says, Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. And we see this is the whole idea of him calling sheep. If he's coming, he's calling sheep, you're going to get those that are going to hear. You're going to get those that are just going to flat out ignore. And you're going to get those that reject. And that in itself, that calling is causing a separation. And so he tells us, I'm inviting you into my flock, into my flock of sheep. We talked a little bit about this last week, how he's watching the father's sheep and the father's goat, the ones that are in and the ones that are out. We see the third thing then that a door does. A door means that we have to make a decision now. 
we can't stand in front of a door for the rest of our lives. You either walk in or you walk out and you keep walking, but you just can't stand in front of it. And that's exactly where Jesus Christ is trying to be, have us be this night. He's trying to ask us, where are you in? Are you inside me? Or are you outside with the world? You know, make the choice now. We see in Joshua, Joshua gives the people this warning and he says in Joshua 24, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the time of decision is now. The time of decision is this very moment. You know, tomorrow is promised to no man. So when we see the door, when we're confronted by the door, we need to make that choice. Do we go in? Do we walk away? I love the story of Elijah. And when Elijah comes and he's talking to the, the people of Israel, and they're having these issues with like their um, worshiping ball and all this, he straight out comes and he doesn't sugarcoat anything. He comes up to the people and he's straight out like, you guys, how long are you going to be dancing around? How long is, oh, God is God. Oh, no, ball is God. Why don't you just make up your mind and choose yourself this day? If God is God, worship God. If he's not God, then walk away and go worship your ball. But stop playing around. You know, make a choice now. And we see I love the answer of the people because the answer of the people I feel shows the reality of so many of us today. And so he just, he gives this proclamation, right? You would figure that people would get fired up, but it says that this is what the people respond to him. But the people answered him, not a word. We see he tells them like, now is the time, choose God or man. And we see that the people just keep quiet. They're undecisive. They don't want to say anything. And it's because to make a choice is to make a commitment. It's to stand for something. And I don't know why it's so hard for us. It's so hard for us to want to commit to something. It's so hard for us to want to stand for something. But we see that when we are confronted by this door, when we are before this door, we have to commit. You're in or you're out. And we see the beautiful part, though, of being in, and it segues us then to the fourth part. We see that the door also then means salvation. And we see that salvation, it's not a right. Salvation is a privilege given to us by God, but we have to accept it. We have to embrace it. Salvation is not something you're just born with and you're like, oh, well, you know, I'm born in the U.S. I'm a U.S. citizen. Oh, it's not like, oh, well, he's given me breath. You know, I'm a citizen of heaven. Like, no, you know, as he says in verse nine, you have to enter in. All who entered will be saved. You have to come in. You have to make that choice and as we start seeing these things with these doors we see how there's this progression there's this progression that's happening you know there's this division this separation that leads to this choice that now that you've accepted this choice then it leads to salvation and we see that it's not enough to simply just look at jesus and be like oh yeah yeah i know i know the man called jesus no we need to believe in his atoning death And we need to believe in the assurance of the resurrection. We need to believe in a complete gospel. And when we believe in this complete gospel, we walk in and we embrace that invitation that he's given us. If we look at this blind beggar, this blind beggar was not saved by going to the temple. This blind beggar was saved by encountering Jesus and by believing in who he was. This man was saved the moment that he said, yes, Lord, I believe. And we see that it's the invitation that he gives us. And not only does he give an invitation for us to be in him, but it says that those then who are in this fold have the freedom to go in and to go out. And it's not saying that, oh, let me go out and party in the world, but let me come in and now be in him. It's not saying that. And unfortunately, there's many of us that think that this is what Christianity is. Let me go and party all week long, but now let me go back on Sunday and let me go back. But no. What it's saying, it's giving this idea of these are sheep and a shepherd, right? What happens in a fold and what happens when they go out? When they're in the fold, they're under the protection and the security and finding rest of the shepherd. When they're out and about, they're getting exercise, they're getting their food, they're getting their water. 
And I love the way that Hebrew, Hebrews puts it in this sense, if you look at this idea of being in and what it means to be in. In Hebrews 10, 19, 22, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new living, by a new and living way which you consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Or essentially what he's telling us there is, you come in to worship. You come in to be refreshed, to find rest. But then it also um, talks about this idea of going out into the camp or going out into the pasture. In Hebrews 13, 13, it goes on and it says, Therefore then, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. And this idea that we go in and we go out, we come in to find rest. And we go out to proclaim his holy name. And it's sort of that sentence that I speak to you guys every Thursday night. That greeting that I give you every Thursday night when I say, Welcome to Oikos, you know, where we are uh, our humble attempt to allow Jesus to carry us home, carry us to the fold, where we find rest and we're refreshed. For what? For the work ahead. So we come into the fold to find rest in him so that, that we can go out and do the work of him. And we see that that's what he's telling us here in this. And then we see another thing then. The door also means then compassion. It is at the door where the shepherd would inspect the sheep for health. It is at the door where the shepherd then would pour that oil on the sheep's wounds. Remember last week we talked about what does the shepherd look like? And I mentioned how he would carry a horn full of oil. And whenever a sheep was injured or hurt, he would get it and he would pour this oil on the sheep. And at this door, that is where we find our shepherd, Jesus Christ. And he does the same thing for you and for me. When we go out and we get trampled and we get hurt, we come back and he puts his oil on us. He pours his Holy Spirit on us who heals us and who allows us to be refreshed. He allows us to give us that rest so that we're able to go on again and do the holy work for him. And the last thing we see then that a door also means this. A door means protection. Remember what I said? The shepherd is laid down in that door. No one's coming in unless they come in through him. And the enemies might be there and they might be surrounding and they're ready to lurk. And we know that this is the reality for us. Peter tells us in 1 Peter, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And the picture that I, I started getting when I see this is, it's, we're all gathered here, right? And then we have our shepherd. We have Jesus at the door guarding. But the enemy's in the parking lot. The enemy's ready to pounce on us. The enemy is ready to take us out and eat us alive the minute that we step out the door. And we see then this segues us to this whole idea of the thief. So we see the importance and the vitality of the door. And now we see the thief. We see that thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we really talked about this on Sunday morning when we were talking about the Garden of Eden and this whole idea of what did the serpent come to do? He came into the garden and he did exactly this. We saw that he stole the dominion of the earth from mankind. He killed man's purity and he destroyed the relationship between man and God. And we see that he just came and he stole, he killed, and he destroyed exactly what Jesus says the enemy comes to do. And we see that it is what he's trying to do as this roaring lion for each and every one who will stand for the name of Jesus. And I love the story of Job. And it really didn't hit me till I was prepping for this. This whole idea of the sheepfold and how it even connects to the story of Job and how it connects to 1 Peter 5.8 and how like these three um, verses, 1 Peter 5.8, the book of Job and then the shepherd, they form this triangle that connect when you start to read. So Peter tells us, be sober, be vigilant, because the enemy is like a roaring lion ready to pounce on you, right? Jesus tells us, I'm the door. The enemy cannot get through this unless I allow him. Unless I allow him, he will not go through me. I'm the one that's protecting you. And we see that exactly played out in the book of Job. At the beginning of the book of Job, what do we see? We see that it says in Job chapter 1. 
Now there was a day when the sons of God, being the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So we see God's in heaven, the angels are coming, and they're giving a report to God, and it says that the devil's coming and giving a report too. Right? So God's like, Oh, where you been? So then we see Satan replies, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. And as I started reading this, you know, this, I started picturing that lion. When you go to a zoo, what do you see a lion do when it's not asleep, which is like 99% of the time when we go? But what is the lion doing, though, when you look at a lion? He's just going back and forth, looking at you, just back and forth, back and forth. And we see this is what Satan says he's doing. I'm going back and forth on the earth. What's he doing back and forth? You know, what is he looking at? What is he searching out after? And Peter tells us he's waiting to devour. He's waiting for any link in our chain, any moment of weakness for, uh, for him to devour us. And so he tells them, I've been going through and forth from the earth, walking back and forth on it. And then the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So now he tells them, hey, have you seen Job? Have you seen this man who serves me? And look at the reply of Satan. And he says, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You know what that tells me? That tells me that Satan had been looking at Job. And Satan had been trying to pounce on Job. Because he tells him, Oh, I've seen Job. I know Job. But you, you have a hedge of protection around him. You have this protection around him, and nothing can touch him. It's on every side. If you notice there, he says, it's all around him on every side. That means that Satan's been trying, oh, this didn't work. Let me go on this side. Oh, this didn't work. Let me go on that side. Oh, that didn't work. You know, and so he's trying to get through him, and he's not. So he tells him, you have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And we see there once again the accuser, accusing man, and going before God and saying, well, actually, you know what, so-and-so just did this the other day. They're over here worshiping hands and singing to you, but they were actually saying this and this and this about your other beloved child, where they were actually doing this and this and that over there, always accusing. If he can't come and attack you, he'll come and he'll just accuse you before God. But I love this idea, though, after reading the context that we read in Peter and in John here, and then reading the story of Job, we see the reality of how much God loves and protects us. You know, we might think like, oh, you know, I'm going through all this and I'm going through all that. But are we really going through something that bad or are we just whining? You know, because when we look at it, we could be going through so much worse. You know, we could be going through so many things that he protects us from, that he stands in that door protecting And I love how he says, you know, the enemy comes to steal and destroy. I come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And what does that even mean? What does that even look like? This whole idea of having life abundantly. Does it mean like, oh, having the newest car, having money in the bank, you know, having riches? Does it mean having a carefree life? What does an abundant life even look like? What does it mean? And seeing the whole context of what we just talked about, the thief and the garden, we see that to me when I read this and I read the context of what I'm reading, it means John 3.15. It means this whole idea of I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Or a, a more plain way of saying it, abundant life means the gospel. It means knowing God. It means having that restoration, that relationship once again that was lost in the garden. That relationship that the enemy came and destroyed is what abundant life looks like. God has come down to earth in the man, Jesus Christ, so that we may have more abundant life. He came and he suffered the wrath of God on behalf of us so that we may enter his fold, that we may hear his voice when he calls out to us and we may walk with them. We may come to him, but it takes a decision, like we said earlier. We just can't stand in front of the door forever. 
we're either in or we're either out. And I love the way like just, just put it, like I said, you guys. Stop wasting time. You know, it's either if God is God, follow God. If he's not God, then all right, cool, whatever. You know, you go and do, do you. You do you. But stop dancing around the issue. It's either he is or he's not. And we see that that is what Jesus is telling us. So I want to close with this question, you guys, as we get ready to close tonight. With this whole idea of abundant life. And I want you guys to really dig deep in yourselves and really ask yourselves this question. Have you experienced abundant life? Do you know abundant, what abundant life even looks like? Or are you living a happy life? Are you just living a happy life? And just genuinely ask yourselves that. Because Jesus didn't say... I came that they may have a happy life. He said, I came so that they may have an abundant life. So that they may live and have life more abundantly. And we've already talked about this idea of living life without God is living in the shadow or in the illusion of life. The Bible says that man became a living being when the Spirit was breathed into him. So it's not until the Holy Spirit is breathed into us that we will genuinely live and we will have this abundant life so i'm gonna go ahead and pray you guys and then bruce will come up and then the band will come up so lord god as we just come before you today we just thank you lord for your love for us that you would come and that you would die lord god and that you would just give us this abundant life lord freely it doesn't cost anything lord god it doesn't cost us being the certain way us being born from this family but it just simply it calls an act of obedience, an act of us submitting our wills and obeying the voice of the shepherd. So I just pray, Lord God, for everyone in this room as we get ready to worship, Lord. I pray that we're able to just glorify your name in all that we do and that we're able to come under your voice and submit under your will. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.